Alente Tambo, within Peru, is undoubtedly one of the most incredible ruins to be found anywhere on Earth. Although many people have been mystified by the site's characteristics, some even suggesting that its shelf-like construction was once created as steps for giants, its real original use, however, being no less remarkable. The so-called pre-Incas, responsible for its original build, did so with the intention of utilizing these layers of soil to slowly acclimatize plants that were once not used to a certain altitude through a process of selective breeding, eventually taking them far higher than they were ever found before, making it possible to cultivate said herbs, fruits, or vegetables within their high-altitude sanctuaries, once virtually impenetrable fortresses, so that with these newly adjusted phenotypes of plants, and with the aid of what is the subject of this video, could stay high in the mountains virtually indefinitely, self-sustained thanks to the incredible achievements of Olen Tetabo. The Inkamasana Water Temple being the final piece of this now lost people's armory, for although the horticultural knowledge displayed by this lost civilization is evidence of advanced culture, their abilities to control the path of water is another of the pieces of evidence which not only proves that this people were highly capable, but were also unquestionably advanced in their execution of said feats. For although these irrigation systems or drinking water inflows are many thousands of years old, most still work to this day. Some of these water features were so well made that even modern re-inhabitors still use several of these systems as they even rival that of the modern system which would replace it, bringing water to the locations. Dr. Richard Mixod, who studied the water sources of Inkamasana in Oletantabo, led a team of researchers from the University of Virginia known as the Wright Water Engineers from the Wright Paleo-Hydrological Institute and archaeologists Arminda Gabaja Oviedo and Dr. Gordon McCowan all of whom conducted reverse engineering in an attempt to back-engineer the remarkable achievements seen at the Water Temple. Located north of the Manuraki Canal, in the sacred valley of the Incas, at an altitude of 3,000 meters, this sophisticated water complex consists of rooms, open spaces, beautiful complex pools, ornamental fountains, waterfalls, and buried channels. These pre-Incan accomplishments display an intimate knowledge of so-called modern hydraulic principles, even building their channels in such a way as to avoid hydraulic jumps. The Water Temple's architecture and hydraulic works define Inkamasana as a high-status sanctuary for worship of water. Intricate and carefully executed cliff carvings parallel to the Water Temple add a mystical dimension to the temple's original purpose which is currently claimed to have been the worship of water. Ancient roads also left by this same elusive group unquestionably tie Olente Tabo and the Water Temple to this once great, now lost civilization's empire. Who built the Inkamasana Water Temple? How did they build it? Why is the polygonal masonry, something which ancient Peru is synonymous with, found at many of the world's ancient relics? Who were these ancient people? Where did they go? It is undoubtedly an incredible place, one which we find highly compelling. There are many astonishing ancient ruins which can be found throughout India. Ancient temples or caverns, often carved into giant boulders or directly out of the bedrock of Earth itself. Many of these ruins drenched in exquisite artwork, carvings created with such vision and accuracy that they boggle the minds of all who attempt to explain the methodology of their creator. We have covered a number of sites within India in the past, many of them so precise in their finish that they could have seemingly only been created using precision stone-cutting technology. And our next site of interest is of no exception. Located in the northern part of the state of Karnataka in South India, the village of Hampi has some extremely captivating ruins. Dotted with large boulders, the site is also home to some extremely puzzling relics. One of which is the ancient chariot, clearly a depiction of a once astonishing creation. The cart itself was not only clearly massive, but was pulled with elephants rather than horses. Clearly indicative of a highly capable group, 
This incredible chariot is one amongst an array of marvelously preserved architectural artifacts, most of which display a level of refinement created with such precision that modern man could only replicate such feats using machines, something modern academia claims has only ever been utilized by our own modern civilization. Thus, an explanation as to how the site, or indeed its smorgasbord of ancient precision-made stoneworks were made, eludes us to this day. And we hypothesize that the reason for this is due to mainstream historians' reluctance to consider what these ruins clearly indicate – that they were once the work of a civilization that was not only highly advanced, but utilized stone-cutting technologies, methods of transportation, lifting and placement that rival even that of today's architectural capabilities. How can one peer upon such sites as that of Hampi, or indeed others – Pumapunku, Giza, Petra, etc. – sites created with such accuracy that to suggest they were created with soft metal tools or with the use of primitive measuring equipment is simply absurd. Furthermore, none of these ruins would be possible simply with the use of the human eye. The only logical explanation is that just like that of modern-day stonework, the stones were indeed machined, cut to such a high quality using precision tools, only then were they placed where they lay today. Hampi was predictably re-inhabited by ancestors based within permitted timelines, once being the capital of a previous Indian empire. What's intriguing about the site, however, is the mysterious, seemingly untouched boulders which dot its grounds. The question is, although they now appear to be geological, were they in fact once relics themselves, left by an even earlier civilization? If not, then why were these stones left where they are found today? Why were they built around rather than utilized, carved, or shifted? They were clearly ones of significance, and due to the fact ancient sanctuaries and fortresses are often re-inhabited, the possibility that they were indeed once carvings would logically make sense. The questions would be, just how old is this civilization? Who built the ancient site of Hampi? How did they build it? Were ancient high technologies utilized in its creation? If not, then how was it constructed? It is a place which we find highly compelling. Ancient Uparts are undoubtedly one of the most interesting subjects in regard to lost antiquities. Many of these artifacts, due to the locations in which they are found within, or the immense age displayed within the erosion seen upon the object, makes them one of the most controversial areas of study. How can one answer the question of how an iron pot is found within a solid lump of coal within a seam over 300 million years in age? Or how the clear imprint of a chariot wheel is found fossilized deep within a mine in Russia. These artifacts, found at hundreds of feet deep in sediment, or displaying a wooden handle petrified into coal, display an undeniably immense age, and as such, are solid pieces of evidence to support our posit of there having been a series of now lost civilizations stretching far into the past. Nature is infamous in being cyclical. Why then would we not be permitted by mainstream academia to presume this be the case for the climates of the Earth as well? Regardless of this digression, however, the subject of tonight's video is an incredible artifact which we believe to be that of an ancient upart. However, due to its incredible characteristic, is being masqueraded as that of a much later creation by a far more recent ancestor. Known as the Sword of Gujan, this intriguing artifact has somehow resisted the effects of time, and although it is enormously old, is seemingly as sharp and as shiny today as the day it was made. This remarkable characteristic, although unexplained, is not the only interesting thing about the sword. It also features an incredibly old form of writing. Eight characters are written in an ancient script, now known as Birdworm Seal Script literally birds and worms characters. Owing to the intricate decorations of the defining strokes, it is very old and is attested to be a variant of seal script. In 1965, while an archaeological survey was being performed along the second main aqueduct of the Zhang River Reservoir in Jingzhou, Ube, 
a series of ancient tombs were discovered. A dig started in the middle of October 1965, ending in January 1966, eventually revealing more than 50 ancient tombs. More than 2,000 artifacts were recovered from the sites, including the sword, having been found inside a casket together with a human skeleton. The casket was discovered in the December of 1965 at the Wangshan site No. 1, 7 kilometers from the ruins of Ying, currently called Jinishang, once the ancient capital of Chu. The sword was found sheathed in a wooden scabbard, finished in black lacquer. The scabbard had an almost airtight fit with the sword body. Unsheathing the sword revealed an untarnished blade, despite the tomb being soaked in underground water for over 2,000 years. How did this sword retain its incredible condition? Why does it seem as if it is resistant to aging? What sort of metallurgy did the swordsmith once use to create such an amazing object? It is clearly an ancient upart, and one we postulate has an origin now hidden within the bowels of history. It is a remarkable thing, and as such, is highly compelling. When Austrian explorer Arthur Poznanski performed a study on Puma Punku in 1926, he later hypothesized that it was, in fact, one of the oldest archaeological sites on the face of the Earth, an ancient ruin dating back at least 15,000 years ago. Poznanski was one of the first explorers of the modern age to have ever investigated Puma Punku's incredible existence. But as our regular viewers would have predicted, his hypothesis is staunchly denied by academics worldwide. Yet regardless of this, his sound reasoning, and indeed that of many other critically-minded individuals, means that his theory is one many others have arrived at, thus it continues to have many supporters to this day. And although mainstream academia persists in their attempts to place this amazing and largely inexplicable site's date of construction within permitted timelines, claiming to have carbon dating done at the site which places its origins at around 500 BC, supporters of a greater age dismiss this dating as unreliable, and due to our own in-depth and many years of investigative experience regarding these ruins, tend to agree that the site is indeed far older, and due to there having been an ice age around 10,000 years ago, this dating made by Poznanski would put it right where one would expect to have found it if it was indeed the work of a pre-cataclysmic civilization, with Puma Punku being a surviving relic of their incredible legacy. Additionally, archaeologist and researcher Neil Steed has also investigated a relationship with astronomical alignments. He discovered intriguing supporting evidence for this controversial opinion. Finding that it was built to coincide with winter and summer solstice, and a precise alignment with the spring equinox as well. However, these events would have only been perfectly aligned with the temples over 17,000 years ago. We have long argued against a field of study that is not only assumptive in method, but is also conspiratorial in nature. Any dating of any relic which cannot be explained is merely an attempt to muddy the waters of understanding, often obscured with an in-depth volley of detailed and competent investigations into civilizations, we posit merely re-inhabited said sites within known, recent, well-studied history. This convincing tale of events, however, is short-lived if one explores any of the said sites with a logical eye. One soon finds that many characteristics on display are not only found globally, which on its own is compelling proof of a past global superpower, but the countless trilithons, enormous megaliths some reaching into the thousands of tons, along with highly advanced, incredibly accurate, yet unknown masonry techniques, all tell a story which academics who never seem to mention said features cannot explain. Not to mention melting pots of ancient academic anomalies, such as that of Puma Punku. How can anyone logically claim that the astonishing precision on show at the site, along with the many basalt megalithic platforms weighing many hundreds of tons, all indicative of a past highly capable, technologically advanced civilization, 
once having been responsible and once one grasps just how many holes can be found within mainstream opinion, they can be forgiven for doubting said tale of events, especially when those who tell such tales actively attempt to conceal such unexplainable features. Who built Puma Punku? Is it really over 15,000 years old? How would one cut such precision stonework without precision machinery? It is a place which we find highly compelling.